All right. Good afternoon. Good evening to some of us who are joining from uh, different time zones. Um, welcome to all of our guests uh, around the region, around the country, around the world, wherever you are watching us from right now, you have landed on the fifth of our seven Jerome Mirza Knox virtual Knox jazz residency programs. And you have probably just spent the last hour getting to know a little bit about um, the amazing music and, and, and uh, thinking <laughs> of our guest artist today. Um, I want to, before I introduce him or reintroduce him to you, I wanted to um, just give a couple of reminders about how you can participate in this live Q&A. Um, we have some folks on this Zoom call with us who will be offering questions in the chat that I'll be moderating and throwing out to the Zuzo. And uh, if you are watching on our YouTube channel at Knox College YouTube channel, you can submit questions in the chat and my digital assistant will be conveying those to me. So we can throw those over as well. Um, we'll get to as many questions as we can in the next hour. And uh, I just look forward, to, I have so deeply looked forward to today's conversation with uh, our uh, March keynote uh, resident artist, Naduto Makassini. Uh, I could say a million things about him. Uh, what I will say is that he is a pianist, composer, band leader, uh, record album uh, president, owner, and, and scholar of really unparalleled skill. Uh, he has released eight albums on, uh, on his own, and uh, also founded um, the label Lundu Entertainment in partnership with his wife, who is herself an incredible vocalist. And if you don't know her work, just hop on and watch some of the things that they have done together in their kind of uh, pandemic uh, duet sessions. They're stunning. Uh, Naduzzo uh, is also the first South African artist to be signed to the Blue Note Jazz label. And his first debut album with Blue Note, Modes of Communication, Letters from the Underworld, was released just last year in 2020. What a, a crazy year to debut an album on Blue Note. I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, <laughs> And if you just finished watching his presentation, you also know that he is a scholar, a philosopher, an aesthetic philosopher of um, just incredible power. So uh, we get every single thing today with you do so. I am so, so happy to welcome you here. Thank you for joining us. He is joining us live from South Africa, where it is 11 o'clock or so at night. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. I, I want to say thank you and welcome. Um, we are just so honored to have you here with us today. Welcome, Dutha. Nikki, it's truly an honor. And um, I must say that I'm a big fan of this program myself. I've been following uh, every other time that I could. And uh, I've, I've really learned so much myself from the perspectives that were shared by my colleagues. Um, you know, I checked out uh, Fabian whose work I've been uh, following for many years. And uh, thank you so much for, you know, creating these connections and, and bringing all the stories together. So thank you. Well, we are the lucky ones here. <laughs> I feel like a kid in the candy store a little bit, um, but I'm, I just it couldn't be luckier. Uh, I'm opening up our chat for our questions. So I will say to our students, and some of our faculty who are here in our uh, Zoom chat, please feel free to throw questions in and we will start getting to those. Um, I have so many questions, as I mentioned, and I usually launch, uh, start, start us off with a few of them. In no particular order, um, I, I am so interested in uh, the, the fact that you feel you serve so many different roles as a musician, as a teacher, as an educator, as a healer. Um, and these yeah. are all parts of your life that I, I suspect inform each other, but I'm, I'm really interested and to the extent that you're comfortable or can share information about it, um, how you see your role as a healer and a musician and improviser um, as related or those separate spheres of your life. I'm really yeah. interested in knowing about, about how you view those, the relationships between those different parts of your kind of identity and uh, persona. Yeah. Well, luckily, um, if you uh, study the Bandu people of Central to Southern Africa, we have one word that 
uh, simultaneously means song, it means the drum, it means truth, it means healing, it means divination, and that word is ngoma. So when someone says ngoma, they could be referring to any of these. But also what it does, it just reminds us of the, the wholeness that resides within a way of being in this very specific cosmological standpoint. So a lot of the musicians, even without them knowing are healers, in the same way that a lot of the healers would, would, would use song to, for instance, in the sand people of Southern Africa who are regarded to be the oldest uh, kind of citizens in Southern Africa, they have something called the spirit of norm. Uh, in, in the Yoruba culture, they would call it ashe. But this is the spirit that is um, almost released via the sound. So the, the, the code to spirituality is sound. In our, in our ontology, in our cosmology. So the, the relationships, in other words, are easier than not to have. So it's much easier to be a musician and a healer than not to be one, because you will always struggle with being involved in the work of healing while you're not thinking of yourself as a healer. Um, and of course, you know, some of us go through initiations of becoming a sangoma, which is someone that practices ingoma, that someone that practices healing. So in, in a way, I, I see myself sometimes between healing and talking and thinking and playing, I always see these elaborations. So like, like in the way that I set up this, um, uh, this lecture, I've, I say something and then I play music. So I see sounds as texts as well, as elaborating, as opposed to we taking a little break from the text, we taking a break from philosophy, but it's actually the sounds that are philosophizing in themselves, the sounds that are healing, the words that are healing. So really uh, <laughs> intertwined. I, I absolutely love that. And I also find that to be such a challenging and complicated concept uh, that, probably takes a whole life to, and more <laughs> yep. to, to negotiate. Um, yeah, uh, so oh, I have, we have a question in here from one of our students, uh, one of our jazz piano players. Um, right. So we've got a, a pianist asking, uh, um, not necessarily a piano specific question. Um, who are some of the artists from South Africa that you would recommend for someone to learn more about the music from your area, specifically the drumming styles? Uh, she's interested in both jazz and more traditional styles. Great. So a similar thing, uh, everyone in essence that calls themselves a musician should be a drummer. This, these cultures are more a reality in West Africa than maybe in South Africa for obvious uh, colonial histories and, and, and this erasure that comes with the colonial period. But to answer more specifically, I would say look at for the traditional drums coming into jazz, you could look at someone like Tebe Lipere. You could look at someone uh, like Matobi Jani. Uh, you could then also look at uh, some of the, the, the recent guys that are playing the, the jazz kids like Anda Sikate, uh, Spelelo, Mazibugo, um, you know, uh, Dumi Mohorosi, there's just like so many really great musicians, but also, uh, I mean, beyond drumming, just like the genre itself, it's similar to the US in a way that is characterized by movements. So from the 60s, there was the Blue Note, uh, Huma Sigela, and coming all the way in the 70s, there is Mampini Sesol and Begim uh, Selebu, and you know, all the people that you possibly might know. But currently, there are a lot of piano players that are actually kind of like heading particular movements. So I'm thinking here about Andy Leena, a pianist, Carl Shepard, another pianist, Afrikam Kize, a very good friend of mine. And, a phenomenal piano player and their singers, like you said, Oma Gugu, saxophone players, Linda, you know. So, but I think one way to uh, really get into it is checking maybe my last record and check who those guys play with and, and follow it in that kind of way. Yeah. Uh, 
she will appreciate that answer because Sophia is also a percussionist, as I should have said, as well as a piano player. And um, oh, I, beautiful. I am also a percussionist, so I promise I didn't I didn't pay you to tell everyone to listen to the <laughs> Sophia. But, but I agree with you 100% for what it's worth. <laughs> um, so another question that comes our way, uh, I wonder about um, your experience with the unknown. When you talk about the, the known, the unknown, and yeah. the new knowing, um, as you gather experience as an improviser or a collaborator or both, do you find that things become less unknown, less unfamiliar, which leads to the question, how do you maintain that engagement with the unfamiliar? I, I, um, I think about you know, students who are starting out in improvisation, almost everything is unknown. But as you acquire True. skills and experience, some of the things that were completely unknown to you when you were developing as an improviser are now less unknown, I guess, or more known. That's very true. So how, yeah, how do you, how do you, what, what strategies do you use or how do you think about maintaining that, um, the ability to access the unknown as you start to know more and more? I guess maybe that's the way to ask. That's that. true. That's, the, well, that's such a great question to start with in a sense that, um, I, I mentioned something in the lecture about like the, the unknown and the known essentially being in this kind of collaboration. So in jazz and improvisation, like if you do your first classes, they would start talking about tension and release, you know, both in terms of your choice of notes. So like we would really start by introducing students to things that are very diatonic that, you know, are within a particular tonality. And then we start saying, well, we have available tensions and, and such as the sharp 11, we have the ninth in the major chord. And so, so there's a, a kind of vocabulary that is common that is also at play when you are playing in the unknown. So in other words, the tools will always be familiar. What becomes interesting is, is how you allow the moment to suggest how you come to these tools. So essentially, one might argue and say nothing in this world is not known. But the possibility of playing a particular note after another note in a particular music, musical circumstance is always something new. Um, in the same way that like, you know, I have a, a, a friend, um, his name is Logan Richardson. He plays beautiful you know, uh, I would recommend for everyone to check him out. Um, and, and, you know, he, you can tell stylistically that he studied Charlie Parker a lot, you know, as, as just part of his vocabulary. But it's so interesting how he starts playing Parker from the middle going back, backward or from the middle going this way and back this way. So it's, it's kind of like allowing yourself to see more from even the things that you know. It's realizing that going between C and D, there are a million ways you could do it, you know, and, and, and then realizing that there is always a possibility of approaching it differently, you know. So, so I think practicing, like I'm suggesting, you practice all the things. So you, because ultimately practicing is this exercise that is impossible of trying to know everything. <laughs> and when you get on the bandstand, you make sense of a realization that actually I do not know everything, but I'm using everything that I know in order to produce something I do not know. So the relationship there is very important. That actually leads to another question that was sent my way. What uh, you talked about how you mentioned practice, your know, practice sessions. What does a practice session for you look like? What, when you, when you practice, do you have, a certain method, a certain approach, or what, what does that look like for you? Yeah, the, the answer to that is uh, multi-layered because it's related to what time, uh, in what period of my playing. So of course, like, you know, uh, at the beginning, hand on, hand on, hand on, scale, scale, scales. You know what I mean? Intervals, intervals, intervals. And, and, and of course, as, as I grow, I start playing, okay, I want to practice sets of changes. Oh, here's another thing. I used to transcribe a lot. And something interesting would happen when I transcribe someone for a period. So I would go and say, I'm transcribing someone like McCoy Tyner for a period. And it's amazing uh, how 
playing particular phrases or musical ideas of a, a particular individual, you start like, you know, moving in a particular way. So in a way, sometimes transcribing is transcribing a wholeness. Like someone that plays monk, it's, it's impossible to stand still or to sit still when you play a particular phrase in the way that monk played it. So there is that as well, like, you know, how you teach a kid to walk, you hold them by hand. So, but when they can walk, they can, but it doesn't really guarantee that you'll never fall ever again. So it's just, it's, it's, it's that whole thing of like, you know, making new relationships always and, 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 and trying to, um, whatever that you are attracted to, just create an exercise around it. That's another tip. For, for students, like, cause for me, when I was a student practicing used to be so boring, I would force myself for many hours. And what I realized later was that whatever that I'm interested in now, let me create exercises around that. So I create a lot of exercises for myself where I'm like, I'm attracted to sounds of the deaths in a diminished scale. And then I just play, create lots of music composing that. And, you know, so, whatever that you are attracted to, there's nothing wrong with just focusing on that. But the rudiments of the instruments are just standard to everyone. Every other time I can get a chance, I practice my arpeggios, my scales, look at hand on and, and those kind of things. So that is standard. But also do things that are exciting for you, like make sure you, you enjoy the process. Yeah. I think that's great and a great reminder to students too that um, that those those hand and exercises that you know if you may have started when you were 12 or 13 years old are things <laughs> that you're going to revisit for the rest of your life and that they still have yep. power and meaning and and that it's not about uh kind of closing the book on any particular part of your practice but there we go those things in the rotation yeah yep. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yep. um and there can be something very um, meditative and hypnotic about getting into a session with Hannon and running exercises and scales that can be, um, if you let yourself, really enjoyable. <laughs> or it has yeah. Been at times. You know, I have students that have transposed it to various keys. So like, you know, you would think of like Hannon, like the very first exercise. It's in C. Most of the stuff is in C. But as soon as you move it a semitone above, everything changes, the considerations and it's... <laughs> It's just like, you know, and, 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 and so those kind of challenges, challenging ourselves keeps us excited somehow, like just trying something really strange or try to play a phrase backward, <laughs> see I, what that, happens. That's a wonderful, t that's a really <laughs> wonderful tip to take something, I mean, to talk about taking the known and making it unknown, but it also, you learn the structure in a whole different way. It's a great, great tip. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> speaking of kind of on the same tangent, um, the unknown is is pretty scary for many people, um, or maybe for yeah. all people at some times. How do you how do you combat the fear of the unknown in order to be fully present in it? Or is fear part of the experience that you shouldn't try to push away? Yeah, I would say the later, in a sense that, like you know. I think a lot about vulnerability when I'm when I'm playing and 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 um actually opening room for it, you know, because you realize that um you know, here's the thing, like when we're playing jazz and, and we're listening to a lot of records, sometimes we just fear not the unknown, but because we listen to such great musicians playing, we fear our own selves and our ideas that might be childish sometimes, that might seem insignificant sometimes. So it's just like really embracing yourself. You know, it's, 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 it's understanding that, you know, you, you move, through different stages of your development. And I mean, like even people that have been playing for 60 years, they will still say, man, just before I go on the stage, I just like have this fright that is, you know, or, you know, so these, these kind of things are not things to overcome, but I things to collaborate with. So similarly, you know, it's the unknown is just, just because in the very nature of a human being, I want to know when I stand up here, if I attend here, I need to know what, what is happening. It's just the nature of a human being. And, 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 and jazz is a good exercise for a human being to step 
step outside of that comfort zone of, of knowing everything and, and, and understanding that it's impossible. You know, after practicing and doing your best, but it's still impossible to know. You know, it's, it's just making peace with that, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Well, and, and gosh, it would be boring if you knew everything, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the mystery would be gone, I suppose. Um, I always exactly. to remind myself, yeah, in those moments of stage fright or fear that um, it's, it's also kind of a gift to have that emotion because that's your, yep. your mind, your body telling you that you are really, really alive. It's, it's, yep. <laughs> There's, you are you are there. It may not be the most pleasant feeling, but boy, you are you are living your life a hundred percent when you're having those kinds of feelings. So. Yeah, and 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 it's amazing as well. I always use this like metaphor of gravity versus grace. You know that like there is a natural kind of pulling always, which is gravity. But there's something that happens when we allow ourselves not to know, which I I call grace in a sense that this kind of being lifted, you realize a second later that actually this is the most beautiful feeling. Some of the greatest improvisers, um, you know, I think of someone like Kit Jarrett who so spontaneous, you know, can, can just like really travel miles, you know, and, 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 and the fact that like, he says in one interview that like all of it is happening in real time. He just said to accept that like, you know, it's total submission, you know, you, you just have to step in. And, and I think maybe that's also listening to a lot of interviews because I, I, my students don't listen to enough interviews or documentaries and stuff. So somehow, because we, we want to play, right? But there's a lot that we can learn from how people get to that point where they start playing. So it's sometimes it's shaping the thinking. So I try to work with my students on the thinking, like, you know, how can we cultivate a better thinker that can produce a better uh, improviser? So to think a bit more critical about certain things towards, you know, getting used to a challenging space, it, you know, yeah. You have very lucky students. I have a feeling that your students are <laughs> <laughs> just living their best lives working with you. Um, uh, I have another question in the chat on the note of, uh, on the same um, uh, issue of practicing, uh, what is your advice for dealing with musical burnout? Is that something you've ever experienced, especially during this time where, and I'm, I'm reading into this question a little bit, so maybe I'm adding my own yep. spin to it, but many yep. of us are stuck practicing by ourselves, not playing with all of the people that we are used to, not having that kind of communal or collaborative experience. How, how have you yep. negotiated that or, or, or ideas for us who are, are dealing with that struggle? Oh man, that's that's a very very difficult thing to to sort of negotiate in a sense that this music already, when we speak about jazz, it presents itself as a communal music where it's entirely based on like this idea of a call response where things are bouncing off other individuals to create a communal sound. So that's that's really something we can never replace with anything else but what I've been finding really useful is playing with records you know some people use Jamie episode uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan but it's useful some of my students they love it but I just love to play with records so I just like play some music and get inside and play an entire 45 minutes with the record and sometimes without even music scores and just trying to see how much I can listen to learn changes you know so so maybe that's that's also a good chance to get to play with people that w historically we wouldn't have seen so like you know just to get a, a call chain record and play behind him that's that's a great feeling being lifted by such great musicians and feeling like you you playing with them so that's that's one thing that I could um, advise. And especially with the older records, when they, there's a bass solo and they walking throughout the form, it's always nice to play a solo at that particular moment. Because normally the pianist is not playing and the drama is still there. So you cannot get like a trio feeling with. <laughs> so I do, I, I do a lot of those kind of things. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then you get to have like Elvin Jones drumming for you, but you didn't for free, <laughs> right? He's you can't have a better drummer. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There That's we go. Beautiful. I have. Oh, this is a great. This is a question from one of our um, uh, one of our professors at Knox. At what point can a student let go yeah. of the heavy reliance on the changes and begin to rely on the ear or imagination, or maybe tips for how you 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 talked about this in your in in a certain way in your in your presentation where you, you learn all this, you have the known, so that you can get to a point where you can let it go, or that you, you can yeah um, you have a different relationship. Yeah. And the changes for jazz musicians. Uh, and for those of you who are watching, we're talking about um, chord changes, harmonic changes, the way yeah. that the harmony changes yeah. throughout a piece of music. Uh, um, yeah. We It takes a long time to develop understanding of the changes, but it can also become kind of a, a, a crutch or we get so focused on it. So she's asking what, That's very at true. what point or maybe, yeah, how can, how, can, how can we let go or how can we encourage our students to let go of that reliance on the changes and really uh, begin to rely on the ear or imagination? You know what I find with playing the changes is, is the more you play the changes, you start hearing other changes that are inside of those changes. Um, for instance, I, I, I strongly believe that even uh, some of the free uh, music uh, uh, innovators like Ornette Coleman, uh, you could think about Cecil Taylor and all of those people, when I was younger, I used to think they just playing anything really. But as I grew, I realized that, oh man, so there's a possibility of hearing the, the, the chords, but also the extensions that derive of those particular changes. So I, I kind of feel in a way, uh, a kind of contradiction in a sense that even free playing is a deeper level of playing changes. It's, 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 a, it's a higher level of having relationships with, with, with changes. Um, you know, in a sense that you're still reasoning in a, like if I were to analyze a, a solo that is free, you will still find relationships, caudal relationships that if, if this, the root in this card is a D, and, 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 and we have it, an F sharp on the left hand and, and the guy is playing um, an E flat, you know, on the right hand. You know, there's a relationship there, it's already a flat in mind. So there's always a way that we could um, sort of start thinking about what else is there in the changes. One way of doing this is to really sit and, and sit at the piano quite a lot. And I recommend this for everyone. And, and, and I remember for me, the first thing was the upper structure triads. So like on a dominant, like on a 13 chord in C, for instance, you start realizing, okay, there is a, a D major triad that you could play that produces nine, sharp 11, 13. Uh, but also there is an E flat triad that produces a flat nine, a fifth and a flat seven. So you start by doing those kind of things. And, and once you can play those triads already, it's you moving towards some level of freedom in the changes. And eventually you realize that even the rules that we taught at school and those guys there mustn't break them yet, but like you start enjoying a sound of a major seventh on a dominant chord. You start realizing I'm attracted to this particular sound, but it's, it's about like, knowing to us not knowing you know so so it, it I think knowing produces the unknown somehow it becomes a process that you know you keep searching for more until it sounds like the unknown but I think you could call the unknown the deeper knowing maybe well it sounds like what you're describing also kind of what what you're saying or what what that requires of the player is something what we probably all emphasize is, as teachers and directors is, is listening. If you're going to set up relationships between chords or pitches, it, you, we need to listen to ourselves so that we can decide what that relationship means, how to move outside of it, or how to resolve it, right? So, so listening is so key to everything you describe because if you play all those things, but you're not thinking of, you're not listening to yourself, then yeah. you can't craft that into a, a, a coherent improvisation. Yep. 
Yep. Listening, 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 listening. You know, it's um, and and again, I think intuition stems out of this notion of listening as well. They are related in a big way. Like to to have a heightened intuition, it means a deeper listening. You know, because sometimes I don't go into a gig thinking, oh, today I would like to play. You know a sharp 11 or a flat 13 or whatever, but but the bass player suggests it because I'm listening and I catch it. Or sometimes a singer, you know, I really love uh, playing ballads with singers. And my favorite part is the, the end where a singer just like decides to end in a very interesting place. And and if you um, <laughs> if, if you don't hear what the singer is ending, it would really sound horrible in the end. So, and you know, so so somehow it's it's all of those little things that you start listening more, you know. And and even the drama, you know, people often think that drama is not con- contributing uh, harmonically. They just imagine the drama as contributing percussively, you know. But I think I think harmony is in itself is informed by rhythm, you know. Some of the most harmonic things. We hear them when they are really played in in a in a in a in a good rhythm. So a good sense of pulse, you know, is is harmonic in a sense of being harmonious with the rhythm of the song. So there there are all these kind of relationships that we can, you know, we don't have to bring as much as we think we have on the bandstand. The magic exists in those friendships the, is trust as well for the people that you play with and, you know, just trusting that we are together, you know. Uh, I think it's uh, the great Happy Hancock that tells a beautiful story when he was playing with Miles Davis. And I think it was during Miles Davis solo. And he says that he played the most horrible voicing that just like was so out that he, he wanted to run off the stage and, and, and before he even realized, Miles Davis was quoting that card and spelling it out. And it sounded so beautiful, like the most beautiful thing in the gig. So, you know, a level of trust, you know, intuition, listening, and it's, it's all of these things, you know. And we're not, we're not such bad musicians after all. Like we, students have to know that they, they're not bad musicians, you know, that, that, you know, they have something to offer. The fact that they make it into a program already says a lot about, I think we're working with potentiality always. So the fact that you are already in the program, some level of potential was seen and your lecturers are just helping you throughout to get the best out of this potential, to realize the fullest potential. So, so yeah. Love that. Uh, I was. I also try to think too. If you if you're too much in your head or fearful or worried that you you don't know enough, just shift your perspective uh, to thinking about making everybody around you sound better. Then it becomes not yeah. about you at all for a moment. And in jazz, yeah. especially, we rely on the trust and the vulnerability issue. We rely on each other so much that if you just decide, okay, my job today is to make everybody around me sound as good as possible. Yeah. You have to listen, yeah. and you also get out of your own kind of headspace enough uh, sometimes to do something really special yeah definitely yep yeah and people like you when you try to make them sound better <laughs> so <it's not laughs> well that way. you know my my um, greatest my biggest advice to every pianist um is to um accompany singers you, you know it's 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 just like what it does, it can never really be explained in words. It's, it's, it's incredible. So when I was a student, the more advanced pianists never really used to like playing for, for singers and exams and rehearsals and stuff. So um, I used to do it because I, I was not a great pianist. So, I mean, I was just learning and everything. But before I realized I, I, I had more repertoire than anyone in, in, the, in the program. So I was getting more gigs because I could play more songs just off by heart from playing with singers. But also I just understood what it means to accompany, to play behind someone, you know, and yeah. So that, that is another thing for a pianist to, to really, every time there's an opportunity to, 
to accompany someone just like jump and do it you know yeah that's great advice and all the singers in the world are very happy to hear you say that as well <laughs> <laughs> so i have a question that's a, a total turn in another direction um where did it go here it is. yeah so you released a, a major album in the early months of the pandemic uh, how has the pandemic impacted your work and performance life? And and it's, I, I've been thinking about this a lot in, in thinking about our conversation today. What a, it's certainly not your first, uh, by a long shot, not your first album, but this was a, with a new label. And I assume there was a tour that was attached to this, um, plans to perform, uh, I, I suspect in many, many locations that all changed for you. So. What, what has that experience been like for you? And, and have you seen opportunities that have come out of it? So it's a big, huge question. I'm just curious. Yeah. We are curious to know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very important question in a sense that, like you say, the assumption, you know, is that if you put out a record, then you go on the road and play. And uh, so, like you say, if you then sign to an American record label, they, they will be an American tour for sure. And for me, it was paired with a European tour that I was meant to do. Um, and, and the album was released just a couple of weeks after lockdown. So um, it was really tricky, I must say, because, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of felt in the beginning that my physical self has to be there for the album. Like I have to show up for it. I have to go and promote it. I have to, you know, so for people to, to, to um, learn about the work. But um, so in the beginning, I started by just moving stuff here in the house, pushing st stuff against the wall and creating a bandstand. I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna make some music here. So the album launch was done here in this house. Um, with my kids behind the cameras and some doing sound and uh, my wife singing. And so we did the, the entire album launch. It, it was so amazing. And um, a friend was saying like, this would have been in a club, maybe in Smalls or, or wherever, or, you know, at Dizzy's for maybe what, 200, 300 people. But now this was, was on Facebook played to like 20,000. And by the end of the gig was like 40,000 views. And I started thinking, oh, wow, this, this is unbelievable. There's something here. So I kept doing that. Um, and um, the album just picked up. Uh, I mean, it's, it's downloaded quite a lot. And I think somehow when I listened to the record, I realized that like it's very prophetic as well in a sense, because it's, it, you know, the, the first thing it was talking about a time of sicknesses and, and how we should elevate to a place where there isn't any sicknesses, how, how we're seeking, how we're constantly yearning that place of a peaceful place. Um, and it talks about the spirit as a site for living in a way that is not disturbed by anything. So somehow I, I think this project was meant for this period and, and everything that happened around it was just perfect timing, a universal synchronicity that I kind of feel that music had more function in that time period than it would have had in any other time. So I'm truly thankful and it received so much love, so many write-ups and something I wouldn't have imagined. So I'm thankful. Well, that's an incredible attitude to have in the face of what I'm sure has been also at times very challenging. I can't imagine yeah. seeing this whole path of many months of performances of this beautiful music. And I will just say as an aside, if you have not checked out this album yet, you absolutely have. <laughs> it's just, it's, Stunning, and every time I listen to it, I feel like I'm hearing the pieces for the first time because there's so much oh. going on. Oh, um, thank it's you. Just, it's absolutely stunning album, and so I desperately, selfishly hope that your tour happens <laughs> in the real world at some point, and that we all be <laughs> doing this live in the United States, and we'll cart all of our students to wherever you're playing. That would be that would be a dream of mine. <laughs> oh yeah, I think there, there's some plans already. Uh, for 2022 in, in the U.S. And, 
you know, probably even before I might, I might uh, be around to uh, maybe start the new record and stuff. So, you know, definitely. And I'm definitely going to come and play the previous project to the students for sure. <laughs> and probably play so with them. Probably play out. with them. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Trust me, we're, we're, we're totally tracking your progress. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, let me talk about, let's see. That's not really a question. Uh, here we go. So here, this question. I hear so many things in your compositions and improvisations, clearly a deep knowledge of so many masters of jazz, both American and African and, and other. But of course, there's also you, your distinctive approach to melody, form, and improvisation. Do you incorporate melodies or phrases from the music you grew up with, were raised around, music of your traditions, or are your compositions entirely unique and new creations? Which I'm sure is never, no, nothing is entirely a unique and new creation, but yeah. you know where the yeah. question is in there. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a question and, a, and an answer in itself. You, you know, it's, it's just so beautifully put that it, it already, uh, first of all, you know, the question talks about like the influences that are just like from, so, I mean, if you think about piano players, you know, I've really been influenced by so many of them, you know, uh, I have a lot of love for McCoy Tyner, for Andrew Hill, I have a lot of love for Randy Westin, for Monk, for Begim Selebu, uh, you know, so, so already somehow that, that is, a borrowing from all of these great masters. I'm definitely borrowing from them. And, and of course, this borrowing is, is in a constant dialogue with the folk music here in, in the continent. And, and, and in many ways, like when I think about some of the indigenous sounds here, the, there is already like a very organic relationship with jazz. It's, uh, it's just incredible here in South Africa that when someone starts playing an instrument, they are already just like playing some kind of jazz without even knowing. Just our natural sort of like leaning towards the instrument. It's, it's, it's incredible. Also it's worth take, um, taking note of the fact that South African jazz is as old as, it started somewhere in the 1920s. We, we have people that recorded even before recording ragtime albums. So somehow it's just like been a call and response between jazz in America and jazz here. So some of these relationships are really based on these borrowings, but some of them are, are from the fact that jazz originated in the continent somehow, you know? So, so there, there are these two things that are really there strongly. And um, I, I think I, I benefit from being part of that legacy, so to speak, you know? So I, I don't think so, so much about composition, never at all. It's just things that I find myself singing and playing and, you know, <laughs> yeah. And of course it comes with a lot of listening where the vocabulary again, because, you know, when we're composing, sometimes it's stimulating a vocabulary that exists and, you know, so, so yeah. That's fascinating to me. And so that makes me wonder, uh, as a follow-up question about your compositional process, which you did just kind of describe, but it was, you really got me at the end when you said, I don't really think about it as, as composing, but, <laughs> but clearly you are a prodigious composer. I mean, you've, you've created Thank you. beautiful songs, beautiful forms, right? Uh, so what, what does your compositional process look like? Do you, okay. um, do you sit down to, to, to compose a piece? Do you have a whole bunch of working ideas that you're bouncing off of each other? I'd, be, I'd love to know what yeah. your, what comp even though you just said you don't think about composition. Um, <laughs> sure. if, you can, if you can indulge my question, what, what does that process look like for you? Fair enough. Um, you know, I, I think I will, I will omit one aspect of the answer, which is quite central, the fact that I, I, I have a blog where I record my dreams and, and I, I, 
sometimes hear songs and, and, and manage to really bring them onto this side. So there's a song on my album called Beneath the Earth and, and that really came right through a dream and I woke up and I was singing it. And so sometimes there are those moments. And um, so for me, this, this whole thing has to do with healing as well, where I, I think in 2017, I put out an album that was exploring sounds and songs as healing concoctions in the same way that like you go to a pharmacy and there are herbal concoctions. So I was trying to think what would be the equivalent sonically of songs that respond to particular illnesses, for instance, or people going through particular things that would go straight to that song as a, you know, it was an attempt. But what I'm trying to say is a lot of it has to do with the gift of healing. And I think the gift of healing is also a gift of song. But on a practical level, of course, I studied harmony, um, I studied composition, and, and these tools somehow, they, they do assist in, in crystallizing the gift, you know? So, so I do look at things like, okay, well, you know, maybe this song can go here, more like a kind of production kind of more than composition. It's like looking at how we present a song more than, cause I compose very uh, short songs. Sometimes it's eight bars, but when you listen, it sounds like 10 years. So, you know, it's, it's also about like how we could kind of think about time as a very elastic concept. And I play with this notion of time in, in a lot of my songs where the, the colors really um, make time expand in certain ways. Sometimes I think about suspended time as well, where it's something that I use quite a lot. Sometimes people call it trance, that, you know, so composition is very short, but then there's a lot of this suspended time where it's decomposing, actually, you know, where we, we, we like just finding other things and, and coming back. So, you know, I don't have one method, but, you know, I, I do have songs where I sat down and was like, okay, I'm hearing, you know, something like rhythm changes, these structures that are there already, or borrowing from Central Park West, the John Coltrane song, and I hear a new melody on Over the Changes. So there's different processes, of course, yeah. As you described that, it made me think about your, in your presentation when you talk about this concept that I love about the music always being there and we just start accessing it when you're tapping into it, right? So would you say that that's a similar kind of uh, underlying like ethos of your compositional process that it's music that's there that you're kind of accessing or tapping into, not things that you that you are creating spontaneously, but it's part of this bigger world of, of sound and music that's, that's happening. We just have to I think so. tune into it. I think it's really about, it. it's, mainly, it's mainly about that in a sense that if you were to be really quiet, uh, med, in a meditative state, really quiet, I think, at a particular point, there is a sound that emerges. So, so I think sometimes we struggle with compositions because in my case, I feel like maybe in those particular moments, I'm not quiet enough, you know, um, to, to, to tap into that music. In 2015, I put out an album called Listening to the Ground. And Listening to the Ground was, you know, a way of looking at a pre- kind of colonial method of what were the epistemologies of people? How did people remember things? How did people know the world? And, and, and so part of what I found was the fact that like my great great ancestors uh, made connections between walking on the ground and citing memory from underneath their feet, which was a theme that I just took it just opened an entire world for me in a sense that part of why we are in the world is we are experiencing and, and these experiences are the compositions. So it's, as you are going through things, there's a sound check always, but that deep listening is like, you know, uh, sometimes we don't really uh, harness the connections between spirituality and music enough. So, but I think 
once that is harnessed. You know, even in church music, you know, people um, have, they start singing a song, but it develops to something else. And I don't think they call it uh, improvisation, but it's called embellishment. But sometimes they say there was the Holy Ghost or they use other terminologies underscoring the idea that we are never alone in this music, you know? So I think there's a lot that is linked to our awareness about being in the world and whatever spiritual mode we have chosen, just creating more sense of gentleness and more sense of stillness and, and, and you know, uh, bliss. And I think these things would really emerge. I think Colchain did a lot of that. Yes, and we'll be learning from him for generations to come. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I have to say, I'm deeply envious of the fact that you can recall the songs that, 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 you, that come to you in your dreams. I've had yeah. a number of experiences where I've woken up thinking, I just heard an amazing melody that I've never heard before and it's just gone for me. So I need to, I need to figure out how to capture that. At the moment, oh. I, I'm so jealous of you for being able to <laughs> those melodies, um, which of course is apropos of nothing whatsoever. But um, I you can't know, believe that we are. Go ahead. Maybe there's a maybe a tip would be start by writing out the dream. You know, because I I have this blog, so sometimes as I write the events in a dream, and then I get to the place where the song actually happened. And I stop writing for a minute and listen to that. Because it's like somehow as you are writing there, the visuals and everything, it's, it's also a thing of understanding that sound is also visual. It's all of these things, you know? So sometimes we remember sounds not by scratching our heads, thinking what was the melody, but by remembering like the scene, the entire, the colors and what was happening, the mood. And then the sound comes and you're like, oh yeah, this was what was playing or, or I saw people sing this song. So maybe try that. <laughs> well, if, if it works, then I am um, gonna owe you a huge debt of gratitude. Or if it works for anybody <laughs> who's watching our conversation, then you have allowed other people to tap into more you know, compositions. I love it, I love it. I can't yeah. believe that we are at an hour. I just can't, I, I could, do this for the rest really? of my life, possibly. But yeah, I know. So oh. I, I can't, I know. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we've been wrapping up, um, kind of throwing the same last question to all of our uh, guest artists in these conversations. Okay. And you have mentioned a number of influential artists in our conversation today. Um, but uh, we're wondering, and this is Andy and I always ask this question of everyone, um, what do you, who are you listening to right now? Like if, if we tapped into your playlist from the last, you know, two or three weeks, who's, who are you, who are you listening to right now that's really inspiring to you? Um, I, I just hope you don't mind. I'm, my face is going to disappear because I, I, I just have to check this uh, artist that I've been listening to. She's a pianist and she plays with Esperanza and J.D. Allen and I've been listening to this album the whole time. Just a second, I'll find yeah. it. Um, here it is. Uh, her name is Chris Davis. Uh, Chris with a K-R-I-S Davis. And the album I'm listening to now is called Diatom Rebounds. Excellent. Yeah. That, yeah. So this is, everybody needs to go listen to that. We, we are a little selfish by asking everyone this question because we're asking all of the best minds in jazz to help us, you know, populate our sure. for the next great sure. um, I just cannot tell you what a pleasure and, and an honor it's been to get to, to speak with you today and to have been able to share your incredible masterclass with not only our students, but with our friends and people we don't know around the world. I yeah. <laughs> we are, you know, I, on behalf of it's, we've talked a lot, both in our conversations and you've talked about these virtual spaces and, and speaking, you know, the liminality of it all that, that uh, I wish you were on campus and you could see all of the people who are participating in your event today. And my hope is that at some point that will be, we will get to do that in the real world as well. But 
um, I just cannot thank you enough. And I know that I speak for all of us uh, when I uh, thank you for giving so much of yourself to us and creating this presentation and having this conversation with us today. Um, and I, I'm almost heartbroken to, to give up, get to my um, wrapping up comments. So uh, there aren't enough thanks to you, Naduto. Um, thank, thank you to you. everyone who has enjoy, who's joined us today in every virtual format. Um, and thank you again, of course, to the Jerome Mirza Foundation, who uh, very generously has made this entire uh, series possible. Also to Knox College, um, Provost Mike Schneider, to, uh, President Teresa Amat, the Knox College Communications Office, in particular, Bria Cunningham and Lisa Van Riper. Uh, they make it look like we know what we're doing on in the virtual spaces. Um, and as, as Medusa and I were talking about before we started, uh, an incredible thank you to iMagicWorks, uh, you and Julie for our stunning graphic design. They make us look beautiful on paper and an image. Yep. And of course, uh, thank you to the uh, hardworking, never ceasing Andy Crawford, our managing director of the Knox Jazz Year, who uh, is always behind the scenes doing 5,000 things for every one thing that I'm doing in front of the camera. Um, and uh, a reminder that our presentation from today and our Q&A will both be available on the Knox College YouTube channel. If you enjoyed today's event, you can absolutely help us spread the word. We have two more events coming up. Um, so you can share our upcoming events, talk to other people, share Naduto's presentation. We have two more keynote presentations and discussions coming up. Um, our next is April 11th with Ulysses Owens Jr., uh, a drummer. He uh, is a drummer, performer, producer, educator, and I would also add entrepreneur. Uh, <clears throat> he has released four successful albums gained attention for performances with Kurt Elling, Christian McBride. Uh, he also remains tightly connected to his hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, where his family founded Don't Miss a Beat Incorporated, a nonprofit organization empowering young people to dream big and give back to their communities. Uh, his keynote talk will refer to his second book, The Musician's Career Guide, Turning Your Talent into Sustained Success. And he will discuss career development, creative entrepreneurship, and branding. So a lot of very practical ideas about where, what to do with all of this talent that we have been cultivating um, in, 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 in our work and, and in our conversations with our, our resident artists. Um, I, I hate to say good evening, but I know it's very late where you are. And uh, <laughs> just thank, thank you again. Uh, I cannot thank you enough, Duto, And thank you to all of those who joined us. Uh, I hope to see you at our next event on April 11th and have a fantastic evening, morning, whatever time it is for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki, and your team there at home. Thank you. <laughs>